Mr. Moore was a regular at the diner. He came every morning without fail, the minute we opened our doors. He liked his coffee black, his toasts unbuttered, and his eggs over easy. Though he was a man of few words, Mr. Moore was gentle and polite. Moreover, he was a very generous tipper. And that's all that anyone at the diner really knew about him. A pleasant, albeit reserved man, one who found comfort in his routine. One Sunday, I noticed that the corner booth we'd always saved for Mr. Moore remained vacant well into lunchtime. I recall glancing over every now and then, vaguely disappointed at his absence. He never showed up that day. Nor did he show up on the next Sunday or the one after that. Nobody knew why he stopped coming to the diner, and nobody had any idea who to even ask. No one really knew who he was or from whence he came. As time went on, Mr. Moore became a dimmed memory, relegated to the back of our minds. The hostesses no longer saved that table on Sunday mornings. The new cooks no longer knew of the Moore special, and I no longer had that $100 tip to look forward to. Life went on at Eddie's Diner. But one evening came a man who introduced himself as Samuel Pearson, the executor of Henry Moore's will, and once again we remembered our elderly patron. Tragic though it may be, no one was entirely surprised to learn that Mr. Moore had passed away. What did come as a surprise was that someone from the diner was named in his will as a beneficiary. What do you mean I am on his will? Mr. Moore did not marry or have children. In the absence of family, he has named you, Rebecca Bennett, as the main beneficiary of his will. Mr. Pearson and I sat down at the familiar corner table as he patiently went over the legal documents with me. I glanced over the two-page catalog of assets, among them a mansion situated on nine acres of land some thirty miles west of our little town. I sat there in wide-eyed astonishment, my mouth agape in sheer disbelief. One by one, my co-workers congratulated me, nearly suffocating me with their embraces. Only Pamela, the restaurant manager, shot me a dirty glare and told everyone to get back to work. Pfft, don't get your hopes up, honey. It's probably a haunted house or something. It would be the last time I'd ever hear from that vile woman. And though I knew well that Pamela was merely being petty, I couldn't quite rid my mind of her slur. Before he left, Mr. Pearson wrote his number down and urged me to get in touch with him as soon as I wished to proceed with the affairs of the estate. That very night I broke the news to my family that I'd quit my job at the diner. You what? My mother was swift to lose her temper and lashed out at me like she'd always do. My stepfather merely kept his arms crossed disapprovingly, as if that unemployed buffoon had the right to disapprove of me. Brandon, my stepbrother, was too vested in the football match to spare me even a moment of attention. I hated my family. I could not wait a second longer to get away from it all. And so I called Mr. Pearson. The next day he came by to pick me up in an old-fashioned yet gorgeous-looking automobile. I was slightly caught off guard when he stepped out to open the door for me. Will your family not be joining us? No, I haven't told them yet. Ah, perhaps it is for the better. I didn't quite understand what he meant by that, so I chalked it up to some sort of wealthy folk's polite expression and thought no more of it. During the ride to the residence, I learned that Mr. Pearson was in fact Mr. Moore's personal aide. He hadn't used the term butler, but I was under the impression that's what he meant. For a moment, as the town behind us faded from view, I felt as though I was being chauffeured away in a pumpkin Cadillac in some weird Americana kind of fairy tale. But soon after, I began to think about the man who bestowed this new life upon me. Even on the rare occasions when we made a conversation, Mr. Moore seldom revealed much about himself. On the contrary, he asked at length about me and my family, and seemed to show a genuine interest in my life. He even once remarked that he wished he had a daughter or granddaughter like me. How ironic it was, I mused. 
that a girl who wanted nothing to do with her family would cross paths with a man who yearned for a family, yet he did not possess one. Welcome to Mr. Moore's Manor, Miss Bennett. Please make yourself comfortable. At first glance, it was magnificent. Who would have suspected that the modest old man who preferred his toasts unbuttered had lived in such an extravagant home? In every room hung chandeliers, on every wall majestic paintings, statues big and small, littered throughout the halls of the ten-bedroom mansion. Yet in spite of it all, the place seemed to be shrouded in an air of gloom and disrepair. Mr. Pearson accompanied me on a tour of my soon-to-be home, enlightening me to the history of the manor, as well as the family who lived here for generations. He showed me the wine cellar, the library, and the stable where the horses were kept back in the day. At some point I jokingly blurted out, Do you also come with the house? Upon seeing his unamused reaction, I quickly realized the extent of my insensitivity. Mr. Pearson was, as a matter of fact, of African descent. I apologized profusely, but the damage had already been done. The latter half of the tour was unbearably quiet. When at last Mr. Pearson spoke to me again, I found myself in an elegantly furnished office, which once belonged to the masters of the house. Miss Bennett, there is something that Mr. Moore wished for you to see. He gestured for me to take a seat and presented to me a quaint little chest built of solid wood. Inside it was an ample stack of envelopes, with one on the very top addressed to Rebecca. Oh, letters. Nobody had ever written a physical letter to me before. At last, I thought to myself, I would get to know the man who thought of me as family. At last, I would get to know the enigmatic Mr. Moore. A word of caution, if I may, Mr. Pearson looked to me in earnest. My employer, Mr. Moore, was a troubled man. What do you mean by that? I trust that these letters will explain. I am not sure I follow. I will be right outside if you need me. I shall take leave now. When Mr. Pearson closed the doors behind him, and I was left alone with the box, I sensed an abrupt change in the air. I imagined the voices that used to echo between these walls, faintly reverberating once again. It's probably a haunted house. Pamela's remarks suddenly intruded in my mind, sending a chill from the base of my nape to the tips of my fingers. Anxiously, I opened the unsealed envelope of the first letter. It read, My darling Rebecca, should this letter make its way to you, I wish for you to know that I wholly intend to fulfill all of my promises to you, and that I love you with every fiber of my being. Our separation is but a temporary arrangement. You shall always be the love of my life, and I yours. From the bottom of my aching heart, yours truly, Henry W. Moore. Upon further inspection, the faded ink and crumbling edges of the paper seemed to indicate that the letter was much older than I was. It then occurred to me that the letter was not intended for me. I read the letter from top to bottom again and again, and still I remained perplexed by its message. Eventually I moved on to the next letter, hoping that it would shed some light on the mysteries of the first. Dearest Rebecca, Forgive me, for I do not have any good news with which to adorn this letter. My stubborn father remains stubborn, and I a captive in these chambers. I hope that you are enduring my absence better than I am enduring yours. For these days the mere thought of you gnaws at my heart. I can picture you now in that red and yellow sundress, your flowing black hair and ebony skin glistening under the moonlight, ever entrenched in your own thoughts with that faraway look in those dark, hazel eyes. What are you thinking of in these trying times? Who are you thinking of? As of late, the only thing on my mind is the solace of your tender embrace. With love, Henry W. Moore. As I gently folded the letter back into the envelope, I couldn't help but piece together in my mind a picture of this other Rebecca. 
My entire body shuddered when I realized that I had envisioned her in my own image. For the next hour, I read a dozen more of these letters, each one more intimate and more desperate than the last. As I neared the bottom of the pile, I found a letter addressed not to Rebecca, but rather to Mr. Henry Moore. To Mr. Henry Moore, I write to let you know that I am very well. My mother and I will be leaving for Alabama in the morn. Your father, Mr. Edward Moore, had been so kind to us in the past, and I hope you find it in you to forgive him and bear no more ill thoughts towards him. There is something which I must tell you, and I pray that you do receive this news harshly. It is clear to me now that we were not meant to be, not in this life, perhaps in another time, perhaps under different circumstances. This past winter I met a man. His name is James. James looked after my mother and I ever since we was cast away from the manor. He is a man with a gentle soul, like you. The Lord has blessed us with a child, which I now carry in my womb. If the child be a boy, James agrees to name him Wilfred, after you. I now return to you this jewelry box which you had gifted me long ago, along with all the letters you had Sam bring to me, for they no longer have a place by my side. I wish you a long and happy life, Mr. Moore. Know that I truly admire you for the man you are, and will forever hold you dear in my heart. Humbly, Rebecca Pearson P.S. Please look after my nephew, Sam. He is a foolish one. My hands quivered as a tear rolled down my cheek. As it fell, I noticed that it had not been the first to stain the page. I found myself weeping, awash with a profound feeling of sorrow. Wilfred, I knew that name. James, I knew that name. Finally, at the bottom of the box was one final envelope. This one was not like the others in that it lacked the tattered edges and yellowish discoloration. It was addressed to Rebecca Bennett. I wasted no time in opening it. A photograph fell onto my lap as I unfolded the letter. I let out a gasp as soon as I recognized the person in that creased and faded picture. It was Rebecca, and she was the spitting image of myself. Only her complexion was several shades darker. Also in the photograph were two young boys one of whom shared the same skin tone as Rebecca, the other Caucasian. I suspected one of them to be Mr. Pearson. The letter read, Dear Rebecca, I write to you from this bed in which I will in all likelihood breathe the last of my breaths. For too many years I have overstayed my welcome in this world. Truly those Sunday mornings spent in your company were the only thing which kept this weary soul going. Rebecca, my child, there is something that I must confess to you. And though I dare not ask for your forgiveness, I want you to know of the burden and shame I have carried with me all these years, since that fateful evening seemingly a lifetime ago. If you have read the other letters in this box, you will know that I once very much loved a woman who shared your name. Like you, she was a beautiful woman with a beautiful soul. I, on the other hand, was a selfish and jealous boy. When I read her words of farewell, my heart shattered into a thousand pieces. I was utterly broken. For many months I wallowed in dejection, in grief, in contempt. It was during that time that within my heart a darkness grew unfettered, consuming me whole. On the third day of May in the year 1950, I donned the white robes of the Ku Klux Klan for the very first time. In the months that followed, I did many despicable things, too numerous to count, too many to atone for in my lifetime. When my father discovered the breadth of my involvement with the Klan, I was banished from the house, and rightfully so. I became a drifter, with no one to call family and no place to call home. Lonely and desperate, I blamed two people for all of my miseries, Rebecca Pearson and a man named James. And so I found myself in Birmingham, Alabama, 
There I joined the ranks of the local clansmen, and there I learned the whereabouts of a man by the name of James Bennett, and of his wife, Rebecca Bennett. On the night of October 21st, 1951, my accomplices and I set fire to their home. My entire body trembled as I turned the letter over to the back side. I watched from afar as the house went up in a blazing inferno. I listened to the cries of the children as they were carried out of that little overcrowded house. For a brief moment I allowed myself to delight in their suffering, and in that moment the last of my humanity was nearly extinguished. It was then that I heard a familiar voice. James! James! I heard the frantic, agonized scream of the woman who I loved so dearly. I watched in horror as I found her through the windows of the upper floor. A silhouette among the smoldering flames. Her cries grew louder, more painful. Take Wilfred! Take Wilfred! She screamed until the flames engulfed her completely. Moments later, a man emerged from the blaze. His clothes burnt to a crisp, his skin thoroughly charred. With the last a bit of life within him, he placed the infant on the ground with the grace of a loving father. Coming to my senses at last, I discarded that wicked costume and raced towards the house. I picked up the baby boy from the ground, whose body was wrapped in his mother's robes. When I saw his bright blue eyes and fair olive skin, my heart sank to the bottom of the ocean. There was no mistake. Wilfred was my very own son. The boy's family wrestled him from my grasp, and I was forced to flee into the nearby woods, where I spent a sleepless night, haunted by images of Rebecca's burning silhouette. The next morning, I turned myself into the law. I spent the next 45 years in prison, contemplating my unspeakable folly. It was during that time that I received a visit from Samuel, an old friend whose aunt I had murdered in cold blood. He came to me bearing the news of my father's death and that of my mother and that of my brothers and nieces and nephews. It was as though a curse had fallen upon the household. The Moore's estate had somehow, despite the circumstances, found its way back to me. Some years later, I was granted permission to serve the remainder of my sentence under house arrest and allowed to leave the premises once a week. At that time, Samuel revealed to me that his cousin Wilfred had given his life in the line of duty as a firefighter, leaving behind a wife and infant daughter who he named after his own mother. When I saw you for the first time, I knew it had to be true. You were every bit as beautiful as your grandmother. I wish you a long and happy life, Rebecca, my child. And though your love and affection will forever elude me, know that I have loved you since the very first time I laid eyes on you. Humbly, Henry Wilfred Moore Thank you for making it this far. I hope you enjoyed the video. I just wanted to quickly let you know about a couple things I have going on. I have an Instagram where I post more personal things about who I am. It isn't just all creepy stuff. You can find me at Stories After Midnight. I also have a Twitter where I mainly retweet and like things I find interesting. The handle for that is in the description, but it is S underscore A underscore Midnight. I should really find another one because that's hard to say. If you really like what I'm doing, consider joining the Midnighters. That's my growing community where we hang out and have fun and talk about cats. You can find a link to our Discord in the description below. We'd love to see you there. Other than that, it'd make me happier than a cat on a table full of antique glassware if you'd like the video and consider sticking around for more. We'll see you in the next one.